Hello! My birthday was September 2nd, so to celebrate, I've decided to upload episodes from my mindfulness podcast series, Reading with Carrie, every day through the month of September. Once we hit October, I'll be posting the episodes every Friday with the bonus minisodes on Saturday. To catch the episodes as they air every Wednesday, you can subscribe to my podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Click the link in the description below to go directly to my podcast's website. Hope you enjoy! Hello and welcome to Reading with Carrie, a mindfulness podcast series that can be used as a sleep aid or to ease your anxiety and relieve your stress. I am your host, Carrie Favel, and I am so thankful that you've decided to spend some time with me. I think I say this every episode, but I love this story. If you've never heard or read it, I invite you to consider the idea that it's been said that the famous tale of Beauty and the Beast was based on this myth. Isn't that cool? I can certainly see the similarities. Once again, I do need to tell you my pesky disclaimer that this is yet again another story read a few years ago, but it's solid, so let's get started. Also, I do want to invite you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on. It really does help because it recommends this podcast to other listeners and it can help the podcast grow. I also welcome any suggestions or comments to readingwithcarrie at gmail.com. This exercise is the senses. Five, four, three, two, one. We are going to focus on one at a time, but first, let's start with a brief breathing exercise. Close your eyes and breathe deeply with a pause on an inhale all the way in and a pause as you finish exhaling all the way out. Remember to center on the here and now. Focus on the breath passing in your lungs through to the heart. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold it, out, two, three, four. Feel the breath enter through your nostrils or in your mouth, through your throat, into your lungs or maybe deep below into your diaphragm tummy area. And exhale, feel the air leave your body. Take a moment to feel where you are in your position, whether you're laying down or seated Feel where your hands are, what your fingertips are feeling. If your hand is out relaxed, maybe put two fingers together, your thumb and your middle finger, and just gently rub them together. and Feel that sensation. Where are your feet? Can they be grounded on what you're sitting on or on the floor? Or maybe you're laying all the way down and you can just feel your heels laying on the bed. Just feel grounded and sink deeper into the bed or into the chair or on the ground, wherever you are. Relax your shoulders as you breathe deeply in and deeply out. Now, Open your eyes and focus on what's around you. We're going to follow a pattern. So first, pick five things around you of one color. The first color your eye catches, red, blue, green, doesn't matter. Just whatever your eye catches, focus on five things of that same color. If you're colorblind, Try to find items that have the same shade of gray. They look like they would be the same color. I know that might be hard. Okay. 
Okay, did you find five things? Now let's listen for four different sounds. Can you hear your breathing? Is your stomach gurgling? Maybe you can hear a clock or a bird chirping. I'll give you a little time so you can hear that. Although I guess my voice could count too. Now without moving, so this might be kind of tricky, pick three things to touch. If you're in a bed, maybe touch the sheets and touch a pillow and maybe your nightstand. Or if you're sitting at a desk, touch the chair. Is there maybe a drink next to you you can touch? Really take a moment with each of these three items and feel the sensation that they give your fingertips. Is it smooth? Is it soft? Is it rough and grainy? If you can't find a third item, just run your hand along your arm. Remember that you probably have the phone right next to you or a mouse if you're on the computer. Now this one, it, it gets trickier as we go along. This one, we're going to pick two smells. You can move around for this one if you want to. We're trying to find two smells in the room. And you're going to find an item maybe, maybe some perfume or a food item if you're eating. Maybe you have a drink nearby. I'm drinking coffee and it has a hazelnut flavor in the back. So I get the lovely coffee ground smell and the sweetness of the hazelnut. You can smell your pillow or if you have a pet, I always like sniffing my dog's fur. <laughs> Might be a little weird, but she's so comforting. Her feet emanate this nice snuggle smell is what I call it. Once again, you can use your body if you need to, maybe smell your armpit. <laughs> We can have fun while we're doing this. We don't have to be so serious. Are these smells sweet or sour to you? So if you can, pick up the item and just smell it for about 30 seconds. Just try to describe it. And now we're going to pick one thing to taste. It can be a food item or a drink, maybe some gum or a candy. If food is a trigger for you, you absolutely do not have to do this. You can also taste the air if there's nothing around. Again, it might be silly, but you can stick your tongue out really wide and wag it in the air or breathe in deeply. Can you taste anything on the air? If you are okay to go ahead and do the last taste, we're going to take a sip or a bite of whatever your food item is and let it settle on your taste buds. Close your eyes, take it all in. Just take about 30 seconds to really feel it. Dance in your mouth, play on your tongue. Is it squishy? Is it hard? Is it moist? Is it dry? Is it sweet? Is it sour? What different flavors can you taste? Just sit with it for a moment. Okay, and we're done. Congratulations, you finished the five senses exercise. I always like to indulge in a nice long sigh. 
It just always helps me feel relaxed. So let's take a deep inhale and outward sigh. Mmm, that's nice. And now, here's the story. Bullfinch's Mythology Chapter 11, Cupid and Psyche A certain king and queen had three daughters. The charms of the two elder were more than common, but the beauty of the youngest was so wonderful that the poverty of language is unable to express its due praise. The fame of her beauty was so great that strangers from neighboring countries came in crowds to enjoy the sight, and looked on her with amazement, paying her that homage which is due only to Venus herself. In fact, Venus found her altars deserted, while men turned their devotion to this young virgin. As she passed along, the people sang her praises and strewed her way with chaplets and flowers. This perversion of homage due only to the immortal powers to the exaltation of a mortal gave great offense to the real Venus. Shaking her ambrosial locks with indignation, she exclaimed, Am I then to be eclipsed in my honors by a mortal girl? In vain then did that royal shepherd, whose judgment was approved by Jove himself, give me the palm of beauty over my illustrious rivals, Pallas and Juno. But she shall not so quietly usurp my honors. I will give her cause to repent of so unlawful a beauty." Thereupon she calls her winged son Cupid, mischievous enough in his own nature, and rouses and provokes him yet more by her complaints. She points out Psyche to him and says, My dear son, punish that contumacious beauty. Give thy mother a revenge as sweet as her injuries are great. Infuse into that bosom of that haughty girl a passion for some low, mean, unworthy being, so that she may reap of mortifications as great as her present exultation and triumph. Cupid prepared to obey the commands of his mother. There are two fountains in Venus's garden, one of sweet waters, the other of bitter. Cupid filled two amber vases, one from each fountain, and suspending them from the top of his quiver, hastened to the chamber of Psyche, whom he found asleep. He shed a few drops from the bitter foundation over her lips, though the sight of her almost moved him to pity, then touched her side with the point of his arrow. At the touch she awoke, and opened eyes upon Cupid, himself invisible, which so startled him that in his confusion he wounded himself with his own arrow. Heedless of his wound, his whole thought was to repair the mischief he had done, and he poured the balmy drops of joy over all her silken ringlets. Psyche, henceforth frowned upon by Venus, derived no benefit from all her charms. True, all eyes were cast eagerly upon her, and every mouth spoke her praises. But neither king, royal youth, nor plebeian presented himself to demand her in marriage. Her two elder sisters of moderate charms had now long been married to two royal princes. But Psyche, in her lonely apartment, deplored her solitude, sick of that beauty which, while it procured abundance of flattery, had failed to awaken love. Her parents, afraid that they had unwittingly incurred the anger of the gods, consulted the oracle of Apollo, and received this answer. The virgin is destined for the bride of no mortal lover. Her future husband awaits her on the top of the mountain. He is a monster whom neither gods nor men can resist. This dreadful decree of the oracle filled all the people with dismay, and her parents abandoned themselves to grief. But Psyche said, Why, my dear parents, do you now lament me? You should rather have grieved when the people showered upon me unserved honors, and with one voice called me a Venus. I now perceive that I am a victim to that name. I submit. Lead me to that rock to which my unhappy fate has destined me. Accordingly, all things being prepared, the royal maid took her place in the procession, which more resembled a funeral than a nuptial pomp, and with her parents amid the lamentations of the people, ascended the mountain on the summit of which they left her alone, and with sorrowful hearts returned home. While Psyche stood on the ridge of the mountain, panting with fear and with eyes full of tears, the gentle Sapphire raised her from the earth and bore her with an easy motion into a flowery dale. By degrees her mind became composed, and she laid herself down on the grassy bank to sleep. When she awoke refreshed with sleep, she looked round, and beheld near a pleasant grove of tall and stately trees. She entered it, and in the midst discovered a fountain, sending forth clear and crystal waters, and fast by a magnificent palace, whose august front impressed the spectator that it was not the work of mortal hands, but the happy retreat of some god. Drawn by admiration and wonder, she approached the building and ventured to enter. Every object she met filled her with pleasure and amazement. 
Golden pillars supported the vaulted roof, and the walls were enriched with carvings and paintings representing beasts of the chase and rural scenes, adapted to delight the eye of the beholder. Proceeding onward, she perceived that besides the apartments of state, there were others filled with all manner of treasures, and beautiful and precious productions of nature and art. While her eyes were thus occupied, a voice addressed her, though she saw no one, uttering these words, Sovereign lady, all that you see is yours. We whose voices you hear are your servants, and shall obey all your commands with our utmost care and diligence. Retire, therefore, to your chamber, and repose on your bed of down, and when you see fit, repair to the bath. Supper awaits you in the adjoining alcove when it pleases you to take your seat there. Saki gave ear to the admonitions of her vocal attendants, and after repose and the refreshment of the bath, she seated herself upon the alcove, where a table immediately presented itself, without any visible aid from waiters or servants, and covered with the greatest delicacies of food and the most nectarous wines. Her ears, too, were feasted with music from invisible performers, of whom one sang, another played on the lute, and all closed in the wonderful harmony of a full chorus. She had not yet seen her destined husband. He came only in the hours of darkness and fled before the dawn of morning, but his accents were full of love and inspired a like passion in her. She often begged him to stay and let her behold him, but he would not consent. On the contrary, he charged her to make no attempt to see him, for it was his pleasure, for the best of reasons, to keep concealed. "'Why should you wish to behold me?' he said. "'Have you any doubt of my love? Have you any wish ungratified?' If you saw me, perhaps you would fear me, perhaps adore me, but all I ask of you is to love me. I would rather you love me as an equal than adore me as a god. This reasoning somewhat quieted Psyche for a time, and while the novelty lasted, she felt quite happy. But at length the thought of her parents, left in ignorance of her fate, and of her sisters, precluded from sharing with her the delights of the situation, preyed on her mind, and made her begin to feel her palace as but a splendid prison. While her husband came one night, she told him her distress, and at last drew from him an unwilling consent that her sisters should be brought to see her. So, calling Zephyr, she acquainted him with her husband's commands, and he, promptly obedient, soon brought them across the mountain down to their sister's valley. They embraced her, and she returned their caresses. Come, said Psyche, enter with me my house, and refresh yourselves with whatever your sister has to offer. Then, taking their hands, she led them into her golden palace, and committed them to the care of her numerous train of attendant voices, to refresh them in their baths and at her table, and to show them all her treasures. The view of these celestial delights caused envy to enter their bosoms at seeing their young sister possessed of such state and splendor, so much exceeding their own. They asked her numberless questions, among others what sort of a person her husband was. Psyche replied that he was a beautiful youth who generally spent the daytime in hunting upon the mountains. The sisters, not satisfied with this reply, soon made her confess that she had never seen him. Then they proceeded to fill her bosom with dark suspicions. Call to mind, they said, the Pythian oracle that declared you destined to marry a direful and tremendous monster. The inhabitants of this valley say that your husband is a terrible and monstrous serpent who nourishes you for a while with dainties that he may by and by devour you. Take our advice. Provide yourself with a lamp and a sharp knife. Put them in concealment that your husband may not discover them. And when he is sound asleep, slip out of bed, bring forth your lamp, and see for yourself whether what they say is true or not. If it is, hesitate not to cut off the monster's head and thereby recover your liberty. Psyche resisted these persuasions as well as she could, but they did not fail to have their effect on her mind, and when her sisters were gone, their words and her own curiosity were too strong for her to resist. So she prepared her lamp and a sharp knife and hid them out of sight of her husband. When he had fallen into his first sleep, she silently rose and uncovering her lamp beheld not a hideous monster, but the most beautiful and charming of the gods, with his golden ringlets wandering over his snowy neck and crimson cheek, with two dewy wings on his shoulders, whiter than snow, and with shining feathers like the tender blossoms of spring. As she leaned the lamp over to have a nearer view of his face, a drop of burning oil fell on the shoulder of the god, startled with which he opened his eyes and fixed them upon her. Then, without saying one word, he spread his white wings and flew out the window. Psyche, in vain endeavoring to follow him, fell from the window to the ground. 
Cupid, beholding her as she lay in the dust, stopped his flight for an instant and said, Oh, foolish Psyche, is it thus you repay my love? After having disobeyed my mother's commands and made you my wife, will you think me a monster and cut off my head? But go, return to your sisters, whose advice you seem to think preferable to mine. I inflict no other punishment on you than to leave you forever. Love cannot dwell with suspicion. So saying, he fled away, leaving poor Psyche prostrate on the ground, filling the place with mournful lamentations. When she had recovered some degree of composure, she looked around her, but the palace and guards had vanished, and she found herself in the open field not far from the city where her sisters dwelt. She repaired thither and told them the whole story of her misfortunes, at which, pretending to grieve, those spiteful creatures inwardly rejoiced. For now, said they, he will perhaps choose one of us. With this idea, without saying a word of her intentions, each of them rose early the next morning and ascended the mountains, and having reached the top, called upon Zephyr to receive her and bear her to his lord. Then leaping up, and not being sustained by Zephyr, fell down the precipice and was dashed to pieces. Psyche, meanwhile, wandered day and night, without food or repose, in search of her husband. Casting her eyes on a lofty mountain, having on its brow a magnificent temple, she sighed and said to herself, Perhaps my love, my lord, inhabits there, and directed her steps thither. She had no sooner entered than she saw heaps of corn, some in loose ears and some in sheaves, with mingled ears of barley, scattered about lay sickles and rakes, and all the instruments of harvest, without order, as if thrown carelessly out of the weary reaper's hands in the sultry hours of the day. This unseemingly confusion the pious Psyche put an end to by separating and sorting everything to its proper place and kind, believing that she ought to neglect none of the gods, but endeavor by her piety to engage them all in her belief. The holy Ceres, whose temple it was, finding her so religiously employed, thus spoke to her, O oh, Psyche, truly worthy of our pity, though I cannot shield you from the frowns of Venus, yet I can teach you how best to allay her displeasure. Go then, and voluntarily surrender yourself to her lady and sovereign, and try by modesty and submission to win her forgiveness, and perhaps her favor will restore you the husband you have lost. Psyche obeyed the commands of Ceres, and took her way to the temple of Venus, endeavoring to fortify her mind and ruminating on what she should say and how best propitiate the angry goddess, feeling that the issue was doubtful and perhaps fatal. Venus received her with angry countenance. "'Most undutiful and faithless of servants,' said she. "'Do you at last remember that you really have a mistress? "'Or have you rather come to see your sick husband, "'yet laid up of the wound given him by his loving wife? "'You are so ill-favored and disagreeable "'that the only way you can merit your lover "'must be by dint of industry and diligence. "'I will make trial of your housewifery.' Then she ordered Psyche to be led to the storehouse of her temple, where was laid up a great quantity of wheat, barley, millet, vetches, beans, and lentils, prepared for food for her pigeons, and said, Take and separate all these grains, putting all of the same kind in a parcel by themselves, and see that you get it done before evening. Then Venus departed and left her to her task. But Psyche, in a perfect consternation at the enormous work, sat stupid and silent, without moving a finger to the extricable heap. While she sat despairing, Cupid stirred up the little ant, a native of the fields, to take compassion on her. The leader of the ant hill, followed by whole hosts of his six-legged subjects, approached the heap, and with the utmost diligence, taking grain by grain, they separated the pile, sorting each kind to its parcel, and when it was all done, they vanished out of sight in a moment. Venus, at the approach of twilight, returned from the banquet of the gods, breathing odors and crowned with roses. Seeing this task done, she exclaimed, this is no work of yours, wicked one, but his, whom to your own and his misfortune have enticed. So saying, she threw her a piece of black bread for supper and went away. Next morning Venus ordered Psyche to be called and said to her, Behold yonder grove which stretches along the margin of the water. There you will find sheep feeding without a shepherd, with golden shining fleeces on their backs. Go. Fetch me a sample of that precious wool gathered from every one of their fleeces. Psyche obediently went to the riverside, prepared to do her best to execute the command. But the river god inspired the reeds with harmonious murmurs, which seemed to say, O oh, maiden, severely tried, tempt not the dangerous flood, nor venture among the formidable rams on the other side. 
for as long as they are under the influence of the rising sun, they burn with a cruel rage to destroy mortals with their sharp horns or rude teeth. But when the noontide sun has driven the cattle to the shade, and the serene spirit of the flood has lulled them to rest, you may then cross in safety, and you will find the woolly gold sticking to the bushes and the trunks of the trees. Thus the compassionate river god gave Psyche instructions how to accomplish her task, and by observing his directions, she soon returned to Venus with her arms full of the golden fleece. But she received not the approbation of her implacable mistress, who said, I know very well it is by none of your own doings that you have succeeded in this task, and I am not satisfied yet that you have any capacity to make yourself useful. But I have another task for you. Here, take this box and go your way into the infernal shades, and give this box to Proserpine and say, my mistress Venus desires you to send her little of your beauty, for in tending her sick son she has lost some of her own. Be not too long on your errand, for I must paint myself with it to appear at the circle of the gods and goddesses this evening. Psyche was now satisfied that her destruction was at hand, being obliged to go with her own feet directly down to Erebus. Wherefore, to make no delay of what was not to be avoided, she goes to the top of a high tower to precipitate herself headlong, thus to descend the shortest way to the shades below. But a voice from the tower said to her, Why, poor unlucky girl, dost thou design to put an end to thy days in so dreadful a manner? And what cowardice makes thee sink under this last danger, who hast been so miraculously supported in all thy former? Then the voice told her how by a certain cave she might reach the realms of Pluto, and how to avoid all the dangers of the road, to pass by Cerberus, the three-headed dog, and prevail on Charon, the ferryman, to take her across the Black River and bring her back again. But the voice added, When Proserpine has given you the box filled with her beauty, of all things this is chiefly to be observed by you, that you never once open or look into the box, nor allow your curiosity to pry into the treasure of the beauty of the goddesses. Psyche, encouraged by this advice, obeyed it in all things, and taking heed to her ways, travelled safely to the kingdom of Pluto. She was admitted to the palace of Proserpine, and without accepting the delicate seat or delicious banquet that was offered her, but contented with coarse bread for her food, she delivered her message from Venus. Presently the box was returned to her, shut and filled with the precious commodity. Then she returned the way she came, and glad was she to come out once more into the light of day. But having got so far succeedingly through her dangerous task, a longing desire seized her to examine the contents of the box. What, said she, shall I, the carrier of this divine beauty, not take the least bit to put on my cheeks to appear to more advantage in the eyes of my beloved husband? So she carefully opened the box, but found nothing there of any beauty at all, but an infernal and truly Stygian sleep, which, being thus set free from its prison, took possession of her, and she fell down in the midst of the road, a sleepy corpse without sense or motion. But Cupid, being now recovered from his wound, and not able longer to bear the absence of his beloved Psyche, slipping through the smallest crack of the window of his chamber, which happened to be left open, flew to the spot where Psyche lay, and gathering up the sleep from her body, closed it again in the box, and waked Psyche with a light touch of one of his arrows. Again, said he, hast thou almost perished by the same curiosity, but now perform exactly the task imposed on you by my mother, and I will take care of the rest. Then Cupid, as swift as lightning penetrating the heights of heaven, presented himself before Jupiter with his supplication. Jupiter lent a favoring ear, and pleaded the cause of the lovers so earnestly with Venus that he won her consent. On this he sent Mercury to bring Psyche up to the heavenly assembly, and when she arrived, handing her a cup of ambrosia, he said, Drink this, Psyche, and be immortal. Nor shall Cupid ever break away from the knot in which he is tied, but these nuptials shall be perpetual. Thus Psyche became at last united with Cupid, and in due time they had a daughter born to them, whose name was Pleasure. Since this story was rather long, our closing thoughts today will be the postface, a term I had to Google. I knew preface, but I had never heard of postface. P postface? 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 P po postface? You learn something new every day. <laughs> The fable of Cupid and Psyche is usually considered allegorical. The Greek name for a butterfly is Psyche, and the same word means the soul. 
There is no illustration of the immortality of the soul so striking and beautiful as the butterfly. Bursting on brilliant wings from the tomb in which it has lain, after a dull, groveling caterpillar existence, to flutter in the blaze of day and feed on the most fragrant and delicate productions of the spring. Psyche, then, is the human soul, which is purified by sufferings and misfortunes, and is thus prepared for the enjoyment of true and pure happiness. Thank you for listening. I welcome you back any time you may need to hear a comforting voice or a familiar bedtime story. Title, Cupid and Psyche. Adaptation by Thomas Bullfinch. Author, Lucius Apuleius Medarensis. Version, Bullfinch's Mythology. Cupid and Psyche is a story originally from Metamorphosis, written in the 2nd century AD by Lucius Apuleius Madarensis, or Platonicus. Thomas Bullfinch wrote a shorter adaptation of the Cupid and Psyche tale for his Age of Fable.